So good morning, good morning, good morning. And thank you for joining me for the start of Stress Awareness Month. My name is Andrea Newton and I'm looking forward to sharing some information with you that I know will make a difference for those of you who are managers or leaders with a team that you're responsible for. And with regards to obviously today's um, session, as I say, recognising that April is indeed Stress Awareness Month and has been since 1992. But it's probably fair to say that this year, more than any, it's important for us to be aware of and to take care of the things that are perhaps causing us stress in our world. At the beginning of April 2021, we've just had 12 months of what can only be described as uncertain, even challenging times. And so recognising that different people may be in quite different places now than perhaps they were 12 months ago. And dependent on our own experience of the last 12 months, people may be feeling more stressed, perhaps less confident, perhaps more anxious than ever before. Four. And actually, if we look at the statistics from the research by the Stress Management Society, what we see is certainly the numbers of people who are suggesting they are indeed more stressed, more anxious, even more depressed. There has been quite a significant increase. So in this session, we're going to have a look at what does that mean to us as managers in the workplace? This isn't about us being counsellors or therapists or, you know, helping people to, to fix those issues. It's really thinking about our duty of care and the difference that we can make as leaders, especially during our current uncertain times. It's fair to say that whoever we are, the last 12 months will have presented twists and turns. We may be people who are sadly grieving, having lost a loved one. It may be that our relationships are under pressure. It may be that simply not having contact with family and friends and not being able to take part in social activities. But whatever the last 12 months has been for you, please do bear in mind that everybody will have had their own unique experiences. And it's really important that as the world starts to open up again and we think about bringing people back to work, that we are fully aware that not everybody will have had the same experience as you. As a result of COVID, there is that suggestion that stress is indeed higher. So what percentage of people do you think have felt more stressed as a result of the pandemic and the challenges it has presented? Do you think that's 74 percent? Do you think that's 65 percent? Or do you think that's 70 percent? You don't need to phone a friend or, you know, Google it there's no prizes, but it's worthwhile knowing that whichever one of those numbers you choose, you are correct. Each one of those numbers comes from a different piece of research. So even though they're not all exactly the same, I think whether you look at CIPD, whether you look at the Stress Management Society, whether you look at the Office of National Statistics, it's fair to say that stress has been significantly increased amongst our population. And we know that three of the contributing factors there is the lack of connection, the lack of control and the lack of certainty that we've had in our lives as a result of the pandemic, the social distancing, the working from home, the inability to socialise and spend time with loved ones. All of those reasons have absolutely contributed to the way in which we are feeling at the moment as as a nation. And all the time that there is uncertainty around us, just like the little meerkat there, our systems are on high alert. Our brain likes certainty. Our brain likes predictability. Our brain likes to know what's coming next so that it can keep us safe. And if we think about it, our brain has two primary functions. One is around safety and the other is seeking out pleasure and reward and happiness. And actually, for a lot of us, the things that would 
naturally be occurring that would make us happy and feel satisfied. Things like social events, holidays, um, time spent with people that we love, taking part in, in team sports, for example, all of those things have been denied. So no wonder our little brain is constantly scanning the horizon, trying to make sense of exactly what's going on in the world. And if we look at the medical definition of stress, it describes the body's response to physical, mental or emotional pressure and goes on to suggest how stress causes chemical changes in the body that can raise blood pressure, heart rate and blood sugar levels. It can also lead, as we know, to feelings of frustration, anger and anxiety. And in fact, I'm currently looking at um, some research done by a professor at Cambridge, Professor Bullimore, who suggests that stress is a leading contributor to depression in our world, that stress causes inflammation in the body. And again, other research suggests that that stress response, that inflammation can actually be the root cause of many of the illnesses, disease and conditions that we currently are experiencing. But it's not all bad. Stress shouldn't get a completely um, bad press because without that stress response that's built into our bodies, humankind probably wouldn't have survived this far to tell the tale. And actually, our stress response is designed to indeed alert us to any perceived danger and help us do the right thing, respond in a way that's typically fight or flight. However, our stress response doesn't differentiate between the life-threatening saber-toothed tiger that perhaps isn't as frequent these days and other things that might happen to us. A boss who's a bit of a twit, a customer who's feeling very angry, a situation with a government that we can't control one decision to the next. Our stress response doesn't distinguish it fires the same response to our feeling uncertain, under threat or potentially at risk. And with that, the adrenaline, the cortisol, the noradrenaline that's released prepares our body for fight or flight, which is really handy if it is indeed a saber toothed tiger, but perhaps isn't so useful if your stress is having to give a public presentation via Zoom to 100 people, for example. So stress and our stress response can be very useful in certain situations. However, we know that any prolonged or chronic stress can have a very negative impact, both on our brain and the way that we might think, the way we might feel and our mental health generally. It's said that a prolonged experience of stress or um, chronic stress can actually lead to um, addictions and to some mental illness. And as I say, there's growing research that, that demonstrates the links there. So it's important to recognise a little bit of stress, a little bit of pressure at the right time in the right way with the right dose with us feeling that we can cope with it is good for our system. But anything more than that can indeed bring about all sorts of negative situations. And, you know, if we are managers and leaders in the workplace, I would suggest that we want our people and ourselves to be in peak performance. We don't want to be in a situation where people are struggling to think clearly, analytically, to make decisions, to be creative, to be innovative. We don't want people to feel under pressure to the extent that, you know, people feel ill physically or indeed mentally. So, really thinking about the workplace and recognising stress in the workplace, which the health and safety exec describes as the adverse reaction people have to excessive pressures or other types of demands placed on them. And that's really where as managers or leaders, we need to be focusing our attention, thinking about what do we need to do to make sure that the pressure is not excessive. And as much as possible that we are indeed doing everything we can to protect people from that situation. Now, if we look at some of the statistics from the health and safety exec, what we learn is that 
over the period of 2019 to 2020, the HSE quote a total of 8.9 million cases caused by musculoskeletal problems in the workplace. And I wonder how many work-related injuries from stress, anxiety and depression were reported at the same time. If you want to do a little Google around that, I think you'll be surprised when you discover the number. And actually, what we do need to bear in mind is that is the number of reported incidents. We know that as human beings, there is that little sweet spot, that little point where just the right amount of pressure can be good for us. If we're doing a presentation or we're representing our team at an important meeting or we're working on a project or report, that little bit of adrenaline, that little bit of extra pressure can be enough to make us strive for higher standards, to, you know, just get things over the line and do so in a way that's of good standards, good quality. But too much stress for too long can take us into that rather downward tilt, perhaps moving more to feeling fatigued or exhausted or even experiencing ill health as a direct result. It could be that in extreme circumstances, we may end up in burnout or even having a breakdown. And it's interesting to note that the World Health Organization defines a burnout as a work-related phenomenon. So, you know, lots of stuff there to really think about as a conscientious manager wanting to do the right thing by your team, as well as wanting to keep yourself in a good state and make sure that stress doesn't become distress and people end up on that slippery slope. With that in mind, we know that as human beings, our mood, our attitude, the way we're thinking, the way we're feeling, our mental health in general can fluctuate on a day to day basis, dependent on what's going on for us in the world, dependent on our own well-being, dependent on a number of factors that can contribute to us either feeling on top of our game, thriving, able to take things in our stride, perform consistently, able to focus all the way through to a place where many people are reporting to find themselves right now between that amber and red, potentially struggling or even in crisis. And the last thing we want is as a organisation, as an employer, as a manager, to feel that we are perhaps contributing or making any of those conditions worse. And we also want to make sure that if people are struggling, that through the organisation, we are doing the right thing by those people. Absolutely, we cannot solve society's problems. We can't fix whatever it is that may be causing somebody to perhaps feel that way, particularly if it's as a result of their personal lives or, or domestic circumstance. But we do have a duty of care. We do have a responsibility as an employer for the health and well-being of our people. And that isn't just their physical health. That's also making sure that people are in good shape when it comes to mental well-being as well. There is various pieces of legislation that contributes towards our duty of care within the workplace and that ranges from the Health and Safety at Work Act all the way through to the Disability Discrimination Act. All of those reference the importance of managing stress and making sure that people are not being put under any unnecessary, excessive or undue pressure. And so really as a manager on a day-to-day -day basis it's important to recognise that you know sometimes we might need to deal with difficult situations. We may need to have conversations with people around potential stressors. We may need to be talking to people about potentially how their behaviour may be causing stress for others. So as a manager, we need to make sure that we are absolutely not burying our heads in the sand and that we feel confident to have conversations that matter, conversations that challenge where appropriate, conversations that support and show care where necessary, conversations where if people are indeed in crisis, we have the courage and the skill to sit down with that person and explore that issue and understand how we can help them get the help they need. So your responsibility as a manager, as a decent human being, is to recognise and acknowledge if somebody is struggling. And actually, what the legislation does require is that we are more proactive in preventing that.
So there's something else there to think about. Lots of organisations do really good, really thorough risk assessments around the risk to people's physical health in the workplace. For example, somebody in manual handling, we would look at the risks associated. We provide appropriate training so that we could prevent the risk. We would provide appropriate equipment, tools, resources to make sure that that person wasn't being put under unnecessary risk. But are we as thorough, are we as proactive when it comes to looking at the risk of different job roles and functions with regard to the impact that could have on that person's mental health? And from my 26 years of experience in industry, I would tell you that that is absolutely not the case. We don't have that parity. So bearing in mind, our obligations are indeed to minimise the risk, to raise awareness and to make sure that where stress is indicated to us, that we are doing something to actively resolve that issue. And the sad thing is in certain organisations, certainly organisations where I've worked years ago, stress was almost a badge of honour. You know, if you weren't stressed, you weren't working hard enough. If you weren't stressed, you weren't doing a proper job. If you weren't stressed, you weren't taking on enough. And unfortunately, I do find that that is still the case in some industries, in some organisations today. And rather than stress being our badge of honour, it should be how well we reduce, manage and get rid of stress that wins us the award. So it's important that we think about that, not just from the perspective of making sure that our team are in a good place and that we're creating a climate where there is a step-by-step -step risk assessment approach where we are promoting open, honest, active dialogue and where we are identifying where people are potentially at risk and preventing it. That's the kind of climate that we need to be creating not just for the benefit of our team, but also for ourselves as decent human beings, as conscientious leaders. You know, we also need to be making sure that we are proactive in managing and minimising our own exposure to stress. Now, the health and safety exec suggests that there are six areas that we need to be looking at when it comes to managing stress in the workplace. The demands of the job itself, the level of control or how much influence a person has on the way that they do that job. How much support do we give our people? Are we good at being supportive, at being compassionate, at listening to people, at making sure that people are heard? Are we good at encouraging and building positive working relationships? And do we work quickly and proactively where any toxicity does appear? How much clarity do people have about their role? Are they absolutely crystal clear what you expect from them and the standard to which you expect it? And when it comes to leading through change and the challenge that change can sometimes have for people, are we doing our best to make sure that we are absolutely reducing the risk of stress by communicating clearly, honestly, openly, regularly? Are we talking about the stuff that really matters or are we putting it in the too hard box and nailing the lid firmly on? Often when organisations think about health and safety, they think about the hard hats, the high vis, the appropriate footwear that we should be giving out. But we don't always think as carefully or as much about mental health and psychological safety, both of which are absolutely critical factors when it comes to creating a positive climate where people can perform easily and well. So really thinking about that as we move through Stress Awareness Month and recognising that, you know, as a leader, the shadow that you cast can be long and wide. And really also thinking within that about your leadership style and your behaviour. Are you contributing towards people feeling stressed? Perhaps you're not doing the, the very best that you could be doing. Your communication, is it clear? Is it frequent? Is it honest? Do people trust you? Can people talk to you? Can people challenge where they have concerns? Is it okay to not be okay and to say so? 
Leadership is an occupational health factor in its own right. So please don't ever underestimate the influence or impact that your style, your behavior and your approach as a leader can have. And thinking about that, over the last 26 years, I've worked with a huge range of organizations across all sorts of different industry sectors, from television through to the NHS, from the fire service through to food manufacturing. And during that time, the number of situations that I've come across where managers are dealing with stress, with conflict, with confrontation, purely and simply because a difficult conversation about a particular issue didn't take place in a timely fashion. And often what happens is because issues aren't tackled effectively and appropriately, they fester, they spread, the matter gets worse. And so conversations are something that we really do need to focus more and more on in order to reduce the risk of stress in our workplace. Conversations change organisations, conversations develop relationships, conversations improve results and conversations can even save lives. So thinking about the confident conversations that you should be having as a leader, especially at the moment, especially as we are looking to open up the world again and bring people back to work. And you would be very naive to think that it's just a question of throwing open the doors and welcoming people back, that people will immediately return with a whistle on their lips and a skip in their step. You know, looking ahead, we've got another period of challenge and change as we make the transition from what has been 12 months of uncertainty back into a world where even today, the 1st of April, the news this morning contained different stories of, you know, how things were still changing and still U-turning and, you know, how little control we've got over that external world right now. And as the government present its own roadmap to move us as a nation out of lockdown, I would suggest that as a manager, as an employer, it's something that you also need to be thinking about. Now, you may well be in an industry where with key workers, you've carried on regardless for the last 12 months. And so perhaps things are not quite as different or challenging for you. It may well be that you've still got people, however, on furlough. Perhaps your industry, such as hospitality, etc., um, hasn't been working at all. But every organisation is going to have different situations, different circumstances, different challenges to consider, especially when we realise that people's expectations of the workplace and their employer has changed over the last 12 months. People are questioning, you know, just how well did their employer handle the, the stress and the anxiety and the general well-being of their people during the pandemic. People are also looking to their employers to, you know, really understand what is the world of work going to look like? How do we best fulfil our role? I know I certainly would much rather be sitting at home here talking to people all over the country at the same time, rather than spending hours sitting on the M6. So, you know, things like that, people are thinking about, is there another way of us being as effective in the role we do whilst minimising some of the stress that we used to experience on a regular basis? And therefore, people are also looking at ways in which they can reconcile their work and their domestic duties. Lots of people have said how much they've enjoyed being able to, you know, have more family time because they've cut down on the commute, on the travelling, on the being away from work. So, you know, people are, are really had some very different experiences this last 12 months that's making us really question about, you know, what we want the world to be going back. I don't deny that some people won't have a choice. Some people will have to, um, you know, revert to whatever their employer feels is appropriate for the job they do, for the industry they're in and for the way that business works. But there are equally lots of people who, you know, are interested more so now in exploring remote and flexible working. And we've seen already that some organisations have said, uh-uh, 
absolutely not. That ain't going to happen. Where there are others who are much more open to discussing and negotiating and who can also see the benefit of having those conversations with people. So it may well be just with those issues that as managers, you're going to have to be prepared to have some difficult conversations. And it's important that you're absolutely crystal clear where your organisation stands on this and that there is a commitment and a consistency so that people aren't being further confused and feeling furthermore that there still isn't that certainty. It may also mean that as people do return, we may need to make temporary, medium or long term adjustments. If you think about it, if um, a female member of your, your team is away for maternity leave for a 12 month period, we often have a transition whereby they may come back with flexible hours. They may come back on a, a gradual return because we recognise that being out of the work environment for 12 months can mean that a gradual introduction reintroduction is better. So, you know, what's different here? We've had people working from their dining room tables for the last 12 months. And it may well be as a result of that, people are feeling less confident because perhaps there are certain tasks or responsibilities that they haven't been doing. Perhaps people don't feel as confident in mixing with a crowd to work collaboratively. You know, there's all sorts of things that we really do need to think about and recognise we haven't all had the same experience of the pandemic. There will be people who will be questioning whether it's actually physically safe to return. I know today is um, the day when the people who have been advised to shield have been told that that's no longer necessary. But I also know that those people are not automatically going to swing back to how they were 12 months ago. They will proceed with caution, I believe, and people talking about feeling anxious. And, you know, is it any surprise that people are not ready yet to fully get out there? If we look just at the news this morning about France going back into a further unexpected lockdown or even more local to home, some of the pictures on the news this morning of illegal raves with hundreds of people gathering without any social distancing or masks being worn. Can we really trust that the world around us is ready for us to make that return and actually can we really trust everybody around us will be considerate of people whose health needs are perhaps a little bit more delicate so really thinking about that, whether it's just about the commute or whether it's about mixing with people in a work setting, there's lots to think about. And, you know, that loss of confidence that people may be experiencing, it's different sitting at home in your slippers than it is, you know, sort of getting your face on again and getting out there and going back to the workplace. And it may well be that people have experienced some difficult personal circumstances that might mean they are more anxious, less confident, perhaps their self-esteem isn't in a, a great place. So please don't expect that the people that may have left your organisation, the building, 12 months ago, will be in exactly the same state when they look to return. And that's where we really do need to think about, you know, how we support people through that transition. Not everybody will need that support. Some people may well have had a, uh, you know, a lockdown where they'd got plenty of space and surrounded by a loving family and they were able to jump in and out of work on Zoom or Teams. But there may also be other people whose domestic circumstances perhaps weren't quite so blissful, perhaps partner or um, family members facing redundancy perhaps people who have also been sadly bereaved and haven't had support with grieving in the way that they might normally do. So please do be aware of that and recognise there's lots of conversations that you as a manager may need to be having over the coming weeks and months. Whether that's a caring conversation, really listening and understanding what's been going on for somebody so that you can make appropriate arrangements and perhaps adjustments. Whether it is about having a challenge 
challenging conversation. You know, if people are refusing to return because they don't feel it's safe to do so, or they're not happy to follow new rules and regulations, whether we have to have crisis conversations, you know, if somebody is returning and their mental health isn't that great, you know, do we need to make sure that that person has support or that we signpost them to the appropriate help? So lots of conversations that managers are going to need to have as we make that transition. And as the world starts to open up again and we start to make tentative steps in that direction, I would suggest any decent employer would be thinking now about what that might look like. Thinking now about the responsibilities of that leadership population. Thinking about how do we communicate? What do we need to communicate? What conversations do we need to have? What would be an appropriate return to work plan for these people in this situation? Leaders who would be thinking about referring to occupational health for any complex issues and obviously where people do have underlying health conditions, making sure that we're checking up on that too. And you don't have to have all the answers. You don't have to be an expert. In fact, nobody has all the answers at the moment because a lot of this we're going to be literally making it up as we go along. But as a manager, I would urge you to think about two qualities that you should be bringing to your leadership role, and they are qualities of compassion and curiosity. Compassion in as much as you genuinely want to support your people, you want to help them to make the return. And curious in as much as you're not jumping to conclusions, you're not making assumptions, you're not thinking that everybody has had the exact same 12 months that you've had. It may well be that actually by engaging in dialogue and asking questions, your curiosity will help you understand perhaps why that person isn't feeling so confident, perhaps why that person doesn't seem to be themselves at the moment. So compassion and curiosity, that's where we get the connection that we absolutely need to bring our people back safely so that they can perform well. And so we will be rolling out a workshop to our clients where we are offering them the opportunity to have a look at a really useful roadmap for managers. And within that workshop, we'll be sharing some recommended practice from people like CIPD, ACAS, um, HSE, etc, etc. Really encouraging managers to think about issues before we go anywhere near throwing open the doors. And within that workshop, we'll also be helping them think about the confident conversations that they might need to have. Also conversations that they might need to have if people are reluctant, if people are anxious, perhaps if people are refusing to follow rules or resisting change. That's a different conversation again. So really making sure that we equip our managers with a plan, with a communication method, with a clear and consistent message and making sure they have the skill and confidence to have the conversations that matter so that you don't find yourselves in conflict or confrontation or even in a grievance or, heaven forbid, a tribunal situation where someone feels that they've been treated unfairly or even discriminated against or perhaps where there's been breach of contract terms. So lots to think about. And that's why we're putting together that workshop, which will be available to roll out in May. If you are interested in that workshop, perhaps having it bespoke for your industry, for, for your organisation, please do talk to us so that we can make sure that the content of it is relevant and it's appropriate and it's specific to your organization and to your needs. The last thing that we want to have happen after 12 months of uncertainty is that the world enters into workplace conflict and confrontation, misunderstanding and disagreement. People are going to be feeling more sensitive. People are going to be anxious about that transition. So let us help you minimise the risk of that. And we'll do that, as I say, through designing a bespoke solution that's specific for your company, your organisation, your industry. It will include your policies, your procedures, your strategy from a HR perspective as much as from an operational perspective. 
And, you know, we're looking forward to sharing that with clients and helping them get their people successfully and safely back to work. But this month, you know, as we know, it is Stress Awareness Month. So it's important that as we're thinking about that transition, we are aware of the potential stress that that is going to create for people. And recognising that there are certain behaviours that we absolutely would be encouraging. Being calm, being patient, being supportive, because people may have had some quite challenging situations or experiences over the last 12 months. You know, we saw that even teachers were being asked to prepare for children returning who may have experienced trauma or even abuse. We know the last 12 months have been, you know, difficult for lots of people in lots of different ways. So please don't be so short sighted as to think that everybody has been based making banana bread and enjoying bike rides and you know they can't wait to get back to work please do be mindful that some of your team may not have had that exact experience and what we want to think about is how do we bring balance how do we move away from a period of prolonged uncertainty and chaos confusion where people have been stressed and anxious and where depression and suicide ideation is seen to be very much prevalent how do we do that so that the workplace is a safe place and people want to come back, people are motivated to be there? How can we make sure that we have, you know, stress less and achieve more? And so there's a couple of pointers that I'd encourage you to be thinking about. Confidence, clarity, consistency, compassion, having the courage to tackle things that need to be tackled and being clear on the consequences if you fail to do so. Stress less, achieve more, and let's help people get back to the workplace in a way that feels safe and where they can once again perform successfully. And do also bear in mind that your own well-being as a manager has been under stress these last few months. Even if you've been in a situation where you've been working from home, perhaps your personal circumstance or your connection with your team or perhaps your, your working hours have run away with yourself. And, you know, you really need to think about your own well-being and do take note of the importance of good self-care. If anybody would like some additional resources to help you think about self-care and making sure that as a manager you're in a good state yourself, please drop me a line and I'll be happy to share with you some resources that we've put together for our clients. But self-care is not selfish. You cannot pour from an empty bottle. And if you are going to be there for your people in the very best version of you, you really do need to think about managing your own stress and topping up your own emotional resilience as the world starts to open up, making sure that you are indeed in the best state to lead from the front. So thank you for being here this morning with me. Thank you for attending our webinar. Um, those of you that have attended live, you will get a copy of the ebook that accompanies this with lots of information and detail to help you think about stress in your own situation, your own workplace within your own team. It'll also be supported by daily email tips where throughout the month of April in recognition of stress awareness month we'll be sharing with you some daily tips to help you stay on top and on the 29th of April you'll be invited to our closing workshop where we will recap on some of our learnings that we have throughout the month and also introduce you to some really useful information about how to create that psychological safety in your team and in your workplace so that you'll be ready for our bringing people back to work workshop which as I say is available from May onwards so please do get in touch if you're interested in that workshop and if you want us to create that workshop specifically for you and for your business please drop me a note and let's have a chat and let's understand whether that's something that we are the best people to help you with. Bearing in mind, conversations really do matter. 
And it is so important that we are ready and able and prepared for the conversations that we're going to need to be having as the world opens up. Thank you for being here. Thank you for giving me your time and for your participation. And I really do hope you found it useful, if nothing else, as some food for thought to make sure that you are indeed ready to lead confidently from the front. Have a great long weekend. Do take advantage of perhaps that extra little bit of time away from work. Take a deep breath. Think about your own emotional resilience and let's get ready to get back to work in a way that is both successful and safe. Thank you very much. My name's Andrea Newton and I look forward to working with you in the future.